If you can share with somebody, just take as many as you need and then pass them on back. Okay, as Chip said, my name is Joel Grote. I've spent the last 20 years working for the Institute for Religious Research, doing a combination of counseling, um, investigation. Um, right now, I'm currently the coordinator of all our Spanish language ministries, so I do a lot of teaching and training of pastors and leaders overseas in Latin America as well as here in the United States. So at some point, if I can't think of something in English, you may have me lapse into Spanish, and so if there's anybody who knows that, I may be calling you to help me out with the word. Um, what I want to cover this morning, and... How long do we go to? You've got till 12.15. Till 12.15? Okay, yeah. cool. We can, we can all squelch our stomachs for 15 minutes and give you plenty of time. Okay, great. Um, so what I want to talk about is something that has kind of been the result of my observation and learning, both by experience and from dozens, maybe even hundreds of other people over the last 20 years of interacting with Mormons. I'm not a former Mormon which has its advantages and disadvantages. No one can call me an apostate. Um, so, and because of that, I've had to rely on personal interaction. I have numerous Mormons that are my friends. And one of the things I love about coming to Manti is I always go away with more Mormon friends than what I came uh, with, and that's really cool. And I met a guy last night named Eli, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about him as part of this presentation. But what I wanna talk about this morning is how to help Mormons make the spiritual journey home. Because Mormons are wanting to head in the same direction, end up the same place we do. They have a desire to be worthy before Heavenly Father. They have a desire to have God's favor. They have a desire to know that they're doing the right thing. They want to know that when they die and they appear before the judgment, they're going to make it. And, and that's a desire that hopefully we share. So. One of the things I want to hopefully communicate this morning is how can we step into our interactions with Mormons, especially tonight and you know in our last night on the streets, and look at this. So um, we go to the next part. We'll have to flip through because these will have parts right here. So, um, so the whole idea is to help Mormons make the spiritual journey home. Several things to take into account, just kind of by way of introduction here. The first is, every Mormon is somewhere. I want to look at a continuum of belief. Uh, where, is, where are Mormons at in terms of their relationship to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? Where are Mormons at in terms of their relationship with God? So the second thing is, every Mormon is somewhere different. The next point is, every Mormon is moving. Like us... No one stays static spiritually. You are not in the same place spiritually that you were yesterday. You've either moved closer to Christ or you've moved further away. There's no such thing as a static, non-mobile spiritual life. And Mormons are in the same position. They are either being drawn closer to truth or they are moving further away from truth. The next thing is, every Mormon needs to be relocated. Okay? No Mormon, we don't want any Mormon to stay where he's at right now. And... The thing that comes right after that is, every Mormon needs help moving. Very few Mormons make the transition out of Mormonism toward Christ totally on their own. In fact, I don't know of a single one that I've met in 20 years that has. Every single one of them can point to those people that God brought into their life that helped them move in some way or another. So what, we, what I want to do this morning, my goal is to kind of change the perspective often on interacting with Mormons so that... What we do is we go from a fearful battle when we encounter a Mormon to looking at it more as a challenging adventure. And that, for me, has been one of the most significant things as I go to engage with a Mormon, whether it's the person I'm sitting next to on a plane, whether it's the person on the street in Manti, whether it's somebody who calls our office at IRR um, out of the blue. Every time I find myself face-to-face -face with a Mormon or anybody else, because we work with a number of different groups, I want to see that as a challenging adventure, not as a fearful battle. And then finally, I'm hoping that after this morning, we switch from as we encounter Mormons to go from kind of this random attack where all of a sudden there's a Mormon and it's like, oh, what do I do? Okay, how do I strike first? What's the most 
Instead of seeing it that way, going from a random attack to a very focused encounter. So, let's look at this Mormon belief continuum. I'm going to run through, um, and this kind of works more or less from <coughs> most devoted, dedicated Mormon down to um, kind of where we want them to be ultimately, which is a non-Mormon follower of Jesus Christ. And I'm, um, I'm going to run through these, and I'm going to go into more detail on each of them, so I'm not going to talk a lot about each one here, but just so you get an idea... And these are not all the categories. Um, you've got angry church, I mean, absolute church loyalist, the angry church defender, the infatuated church convert, the uninformed church convert, the apathetic church attender, the anxious church investigator, and I've added to that um, also anxious, sometimes slash open church investigator, where you have a person who's not really skeptical yet about Mormonism, but they're very open to talk. And then um, the secret closet doubter, the despairing church defector, the angry informed disillusioned one, and then finally ultimately where we want all of them to get to eventually is an ardent lover and follower of Jesus Christ. So this is kind of a whole continuum. Every Mormon is somewhere on this continuum. And like I say, Every time I do this and go over this, and every time I talk to a Mormon, I kind of find a slightly different place where you can plug them in. So this is not an absolute list. This is just more a general guideline. But it helps to have some categories in mind. So, how do you locate a Mormon? How do you find out where he's at? One of the first things to do is to remember to look at LDS church members as people first and as Mormons second. Every single one of them is an image bearer of God. They're either image bearer female or image bearer male. And as that, that's how we relate to them first and foremost, to everybody that way. And they're Mormon second. The religious affiliation is second. And I loved um, the testimony this morning of the man whose name I've forgotten now, but as a Mormon, he prayed to accept Jesus. God did not care that he was still a member of the LDS Church for him to come to that point. It made no difference. His religious affiliation made no difference to God whatsoever. He had the absolute ability to come in humility and repentance to God and receive salvation. Um, so, when we think about Mormons as people first, um, I was really struck last night by Eli's prayer. Eli is a college-age um, guy that Becky Walker and I talked to. She talked to him previously. He came up and said hi. Wanted to, wanted to talk to her again, and he wanted to talk. And she said, well, you know, can Joel join us? Because I was just kind of there standing talking to Becky. And he said, sure. So the three of us sat down on the gr um, grass. We talked about two hours last night. Probably the thing that struck me most out of two hours of conversation was part of the prayer that he prayed after we talked to him. Because by the end of the night, Eli got it. He understood the difference between salvation as a gift that he just had to humbly take and what the LDS Church was offering as a whole system of works righteousness. He, he understood the difference. And in his prayer, but what, he, what he said very candidly was, I, I see it, I understand it, and I'm not ready to go there. And we said, great. I mean, not great, but great, we were glad you understand. And in his prayer, part of what Eli prayed was this. He said, and Lord, which is very interesting to me because he started out as a Mormon praying like addressing Heavenly Father because they're not allowed to pray to Jesus. Mormons aren't supposed to talk to Jesus in prayer. They bring all their prayers to Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus. But it's like partway through, it's like he kind of stopped praying like a Mormon and actually was like <coughs> communicating with God. And one of the things that he said was, and Lord, please don't, please let this friendship continue referring to Becky and I, even if I don't come to agree with this different point of view that they're showing me. And that just really struck me because here was a guy who was concerned about friendship and relationship, and he was really hoping that that friendship wasn't going to be conditioned on him making what we thought was the right decision. And we said to him after the prayer, you know, just, just for the record, Eli, um, our friendship has... Not, is not at all contingent on the decision you make. We are your friend because of who you are right now. And that's not going to change. And the relief on his face was just amazing. It was like, wow, that, that's so great. Okay, Mormons are people first. All right. Secondly, how do you locate a Mormon? Ask questions. Don't make accusations. 
The more questions you can ask, the better you'll find out where they're coming from and who they are. Because every Mormon is at a place there, and you may not know. You may have no idea, and the best way to find out is just ask them. How long have you been a member? Um, how many times have you come to Manti? What's the thing you like most about the Mormon church? What's something that's bothered you about being a member? I mean, there are a whole host of relational type questions that you can ask a Mormon to engage them as a person that will help you begin to locate them and then know where to move. And then finally, make careful assessments, not hasty assumptions or generalizations. <coughs> and I have learned this the hard way so many times because it's very easy to go, oh, so you're a Mormon, how long have you been a Mormon? Oh, I've been raised in the Mormon church. Man, you're a Why? How? You really believe that God was a man like us? He worked his way to Godhood? And he's got like all these wives in heaven making all these spirit babies? Do you believe that, that nonsense? That's not in the Bible. I've done something very similar to that and had the Mormons say, whoa, wait a second. What are you talking about? I've never heard that. Look, what? God and spirit babies in. There's only one God. What are you saying? And, and the Mormon was sincere. I mean, they weren't just... What had I done? I had just assumed, because they were raised in the Mormon church, they had a total grasp on the whole Mormon system and the whole different concept of God that Mormons have. And that was a faulty generalization. And it didn't do anything to help the conversation. Because, And so I've learned, don't assume anything. I had a Hispanic woman call me up on the phone, probably about six weeks ago now, to say... Um, can you answer questions about Mormonism? And this is all in Spanish, so I'm going to translate for you. And I said, sure. Like, you know, like what? She said, well, here's the deal. I have spent all my life as a Mormon. I've raised in the Mormon church. In fact, my grandparents go back two generations on both sides as Mormons. And my husband and I have been attending this Calvary Chapel Church for a couple of weeks, or actually I think several weeks, and they just found out that we were Mormons, members of the Mormon church, and so they asked if they could meet with us. And the pastor's wife just gave us a whole bunch of information on Mormonism, and I'm just trying to find out how much of this stuff is true. I said, well, like what? She said, well, she's like telling us all the stuff that there's lots of different gods, and, and that God hasn't always been God. I've always only believed in one God. And that God's always been God. I said, so you don't believe that God was a man like us who worked his way up to Godhood? <coughs> oh, no, I've never believed that. I, does the Mormon church teach that? I said, well, let me read you something. And I have teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith in Spanish at my desk. I said, I want to read to you from a book published by the Mormon church. Um, and, in, and in Spanish, it's great. It's official because it has the imprimatur of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It's not like a desert, but it's, it's published by them in Spanish. I said, so I'm going to read to you from this book. I'll send you a copy if you want, but I just want you to hear what Joseph Smith taught on the subject, okay? Said, yeah, yeah, sure, go ahead. And so I read it from the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith. Um, that quote, you know, God was once a man like us. If you were to see him now, you know, you would see him in form and fashion as a man. And this is the first principle of the gospel, to know for a certainty the character and, and nature of God. And I got done reading, and there was just like silence on the other end. I went, did she hang up in the middle of the court? <laughs> um, and then she said, I have never heard that before. Now, I was blown away. How can a woman who's 47 years old, third generation Mormon on both sides, all the way back, race, not know this? But she didn't. And the biggest mistake I could have made was knowing that about her jump in with how wrong she was and what she believed. And here's the amazing thing. I said, how did you find out about us? She said, well, my Mormon daughter in Columbia got one of your tracks, and she gave me the number and said I should call you. <laughs> anyway, God works in incredibly amazing ways to draw people to himself, and we should never forget that. So, um, very important point. So let's start looking at some of these um, areas of em emphasis that we're going to hit for each of the categories. The areas of emphasis and what they need. Whoops, I have something in a different order than you. <coughs> Example, down my shadow. Yeah, okay, I'm going to give you just the real brief synopsis, because this is like a two-hour story. So, 
you get like the 10 minute, this was last year at Temple Square. Um, came up with my son, did man time, we did the day at Temple, how many of you did the day at Temple Square? Let me see your hands. Okay, so you spent the time walking around, getting the evil eye by the, people, by the men in black. And, um, anyway, in the History Museum, I, I've already been challenged twice by the men in black on Temple Square. One time I was just talking to a couple of sister missionaries in Spanish, one from Guatemala, one from Brazil, and, and I'm just like asking directions to the History Museum. And <laughs> these guys come and they, and they interrupt the conversation and drag the sisters away. Um, totally different story, but they said, we got complaints that you were harassing the missionaries. Okay. Uh, so anyway, I finally get to the museum. And I walk in the museum and I'm, I'm immediately challenged by the guy that's there seeing people come in. And he's saying, where are your tracks? I don't have any tracks. You can't come in here with tracks. I don't have any tracks. No, I have to, no search my back. And I didn't. I didn't have any tracks. So people come in here and leave tracks. So, so I get harassed right off the bat. And so I'm already just a little bit gun shy. I'm going, okay, I just came in here to look. I've never been here before. Um, <laughs> I didn't say that to him, but that's going, people. So I go to like the second or third stand. It's kind of in a big circle if you've been in there. And I'm, I'm there looking at this display. And I'm there for about 45 seconds. And all of a sudden, I sense this person standing beside me, like just you know within six inches. And I kind of look, and here's this guy in like business casual attire. And he says, hi. And I said, hi. I <laughs> said, so, like the museum? Yeah, OK. And I thought, all right, he doesn't look like security, but he's not a more missionary. So I thought, okay, well, you know, fine. I'm looking at this. I went like three little little stands away, and I'm looking at that one. And no kidding, 45 seconds later, there's presence beside me. Hi, hi, how you doing? Good. Okay. That was all. I just and it's like you know six inches. Looking at the same thing. Okay, don't get paranoid. Um, just, you know, you came here to see the museum. You don't want to get into a confrontation. You don't want to get kicked out. And so I thought, okay, I, I'm probably just imagining things. So I, I'm going to walk all the way around to the far end of the museum where, like, the big boat display is. So I just take off walking normal place, walk all the way around to the far end of the display. I'm just looking at that. I say, you know, just calm down, Joel. You've been in Temple Square too long. Five minutes later, there he is, <laughs> right there. Does it say, you know, just, hi, hi, how you doing? Good, okay, you like the museum? Yeah, all right, what are you doing here? I just come to look around, okay. And by this time, I, I am, I'm, I'm going, I don't know what is up. So I said, okay, I'm going to the far end of the museum. And so I go all the way down to the far end of the museum, all the way on the run, there's like this little alcove where they have this big display about how the Mormons all came over from Europe. And I go in there, I said, if he shows up here, I know that there's something going on. And I was in there for probably about six or seven minutes. And sure enough, there he is. <laughs> so finally, after the usual exchange of hi, hi, um, I said, can I ask you a question? And he said, yeah. I said, are you a member of the church? He said, yeah, I am. I said, so were you like sent to follow me? <laughs> he said, no, what do you mean? I said, well, it's like every place I've gone, you've been there. So you weren't assigned to follow me? No. I thought, okay, Lord, either, I don't know, maybe the Holy Spirit put a magnet on me and, you know, <laughs> and this guy, I'm just supposed to talk to this guy. And so I, I just said, okay. So I started talking to him. And we walked through the whole rest of the museum, probably about 40 minutes. And I found out all sorts of stuff. I started asking questions, you know, I'm trying to follow my own rules here and not be paranoid. And it comes out that he's, you know, raised in a Mormon family, he's single, um, has a red miracle of forgiveness, cool. I don't have to start from ground one with this guy. Knows about it. And to capsulize all that, what it finally came down to was, through the whole thing, I'm asking him questions about the, kind of the impossible gospel thing. And he's, he's starting to get it. And we finally get to the end, and I'm by the door, and by this time I'm thinking, everybody's probably left without me, because I'm like 20 minutes later when we were supposed to meet. And with one eye, I'm kind of...
kind of do, doing double praying, because I'm praying that the initial security guy who confronted me at the beginning, because we're back around the entrance, doesn't show up. And he never did. It was really cool. And I'm praying for Don, because by this time I found out his name and what he does. He's just a businessman, and he comes in here to hang out on lunchtime sometime. And finally, through talking, we get to the point where he gets it. He understands the difference. Because I've talked about, are you going to make it? And he finally says, well, no. And I said, you've got a choice of either working for your own perfection, which you've admitted you're never going to get, or accepting the perfection that's being offered to you through Christ. And that that's a choice that's up to you. And my whole point was, I got to that point where I got, because he finally asked me the question. He finally said, so if the LDS way of being perfect isn't going to work, What's the answer? Well, that's the question I'm waiting to hear. Because until that point, I'm not going to share the gospel with him. Because he's, 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 he thinks he's got it figured out. Now that he asked me that, and so, okay, he wants to know. And so then I had a chance to share with him. The only reason I even got to that point was because I took the time to listen and tried to put him. And he kind of falls into that... Um, kind of apathetic church attender category. And once I figured that out, then I kind of knew where to go with him and what sort of questions to ask. All right, so let's go to the areas of emphasis and what they mean. In each of the categories, I'm going to look at these four areas of emphasis and kind of evaluate them. So you can just kind of stick those up there. First, attitude. What's the Mormon's attitude toward the LDS church and spiritual truth? Second, what's the relevant truth in other words, what truth from the Bible do they need to know and experience? Third, what's the focus in terms of my conversation? Where should we place our focus as we interact with them? Because it's going to be different with different people. And finally, the goal. What should be our goal for the Mormon for this encounter? And so I'm going to look at those for each of these steps because they're going to be different. I'm going to run through these um, fairly quickly and just give you some examples as I have them. So, the Absolute Church Loyalist, Angry Church Defender. I've grouped some of these together because they tend to be very similar. And again, this is not a hard, fast categorization. There's going to be overlap. You're going to go, well, couldn't you use this with that? Yeah, you could. But it's just to kind of give you some places to put a Mormon as you talk to them. So, this category is the easiest to recognize and the hardest to deal with. Why? They have no interest in doing anything. They have no interest in moving. They are absolutely committed. Um, to the church. So, what's their attitude? Their attitude is, it's working for me. Why are you persecuting us? You hear that from a person, you can be pretty sure this is the category they're in. Um, so then, what's the relevant truth? If this is where the person's at, they're kind of hard toward any movement, they're really not interested, they feel like you're persecuting them, you're the bad guy. The relevant truth is that they are loved and they're cared about as a person. Because these people are incredibly defensive. They think that you are the enemy. And they think you think they're the enemy. And so maybe what needs to happen is no dialogue at all about Mormonism initially. What you need to do is connect with them as a person. Which can be very hard because they're like keeping you at arm's length. And when I was in San Antonio, has it been two years now, Keith? Yeah. When I was in San Antonio, there was a, a Mormon policeman who was assigned to do like the temple work. And... Ran into, saw him a number of different times, so he knew I was with Keith and company, and, and that is my son there. In fact, at one point, he actually followed my son and I into the men's room at the ward building, um, because he was like keeping an eye on us, because we were, had been identified as people who had been distributing literature and taking the temple tour and all that. And so, this is where this guy's at, so he knows. Well, on one of the last nights we're going to be there, I wanted to go get some pictures of the temple at night. And so we kind of walked up, and we kind of parked and took the back way across like this field to get some shots from further away. And then finally went, and uh, we're across the street, and I wanted to get over to the other side of the street, so I wasn't inside Temple property, but I was still on their side of the sidewalk. And he was there, and he came up and said, what are you guys doing sneaking around? I go, well, we weren't really sneaking. We were out taking pictures in the field. I'm trying to get some pictures of the temple because we're going to leave tomorrow. And he said, well... You just need to leave, because you shouldn't be around here. I said, well, you know, we would really like to, to take some pictures, but I was going to ask permission, because I know, you know, we're fairly close here, and so, um, so if you really don't want me to, but, you know, is there a special reason for that? Said, well, he, the, 
reason he gave didn't make a whole lot of sense. So I started asking him questions. So I realized, okay, here's a guy who's obviously loyal to the church. He's a policeman. Um, he's already got a really negative view of me and my son. And I don't even know exactly how the conversation initiated. Um, and that'll kind of be how it is when God works. You may look back and go, whoa, how did that happen? Well, that's because God was working. But anyway, we started talking. And I found out that he'd come to San Antonio to take a job as a police officer, didn't like it, wasn't happy, really wanted to move back closer toward Utah. Um, in the last, I think, six to eight months, had lost a son who was only like three or four years old. And was still reeling from that. And I mean, I got seven kids. I'm there with my son. And you know, and he says that, and my heart just, my heart breaks for him because I haven't lost any of my kids. And so I cannot imagine doing that. And all of a sudden, we're talking father of son to father of son, not anti-Mormon, Mormon defender. And I watched his whole demeanor change as I simply empathized with him and found out and asked questions. And after probably talking for probably just 10, 12, 15 minutes, um, I just said, so is there any chance that we could get some pictures of the temple before we leave? And he said, yeah, sure, it won't be a problem. Go ahead. And, um, and I was like, wow, major change. Well, what happened? What happened was the level of our interaction changed and we were no longer antagonists. At some level, we had found some common ground. And I, had, I felt no liberty and no push by the Spirit to like try to witness it or try to engage him at a doctrinal level. Because one, I know, I don't know if he's still there in San Antonio, Keith, but I know Keith had had interaction with him. But my prayer was this, and this is where we want to go in terms of your goal. The goal is softness toward future truth. Because we can't do it all. We, we can't, I mean, when you hear the testimonies of some of these former Mormons, I was blown away last year at some of the testimonies because somebody had said earlier, the average amount of time it takes from when a Mormon has their first encounter with something that challenges Mormonism to where they actually come to Christ is like seven years. That's how long the process can take. And at least two different people that shared, when they identified when they were first talked to to where they came to Christ for them, it was almost seven years to like the month. It was amazing. So we shouldn't ever think or ever feel the pressure to bring about change all at once. My goal was simply to move him towards softness, toward future truth. So the next Christian he encounters, he may be a little more open to them, a little less hostile, a little less defensive. Um, okay, let's go to the next one. The infatuated or uninformed church member. And I'm going to group these two together. What about them? They love the church. These are people who just gush over the church. Sister missionaries fall into this category. <laughs> they cannot tell you enough about the church. And it's interesting to me because it's never Jesus. I never hear a Mormon gush over Jesus. They gush over the Mormon church. I mean, because that's, that's, their, that's their first love. And so the new convert or the uninformed church um, convert or the... The invention. And here's what you hear. In fact, I heard this last night. I talked to a couple from Ecuador. I was trying to interview Hispanic Mormons, and that's kind of my way to start talking. So I'm asking questions about Hispanic Mormons and Hollywood and stuff. And so I sat down with this couple and did that. And what, and what did she say at some point, you know, when I started raising some questions? Well, you know, the people aren't perfect, but the church is. Okay, if you hear that, you are talking to someone who is in love with the Mormon church. They are totally given over. They probably, if they've had a doubt, they have written that off to Satan, and, you know, they're going onward and forward. So, what are the relevant truths, then, to try to communicate to people who are at this point? Well, and the, it isn't necessarily in this order. These are just things to cover, if you have the opportunity to. First, they've been deceived. There is stuff, I can guarantee you, there is stuff they don't know about the church. Because if they knew it, they wouldn't be as infatuated with it as they were. And, you know, Janelle's testimony was so great. Hers came through investigating her family history. She goes, this is a yicky. Oh, okay. But until you know that stuff, there, there's no reason to doubt 
it, it's, you know, it's like the kids, uh, kids, young people, when you first, okay, how many of you parents, I'll ask your parents a question as a parent, how many of you parents have had a kid who has a new love of their life, and you look at this person, and it's most often girls with guys, and you go, this guy's bad news. What happens if you go to your daughter, because I have three daughters, you go to your daughter and you say, um, I don't think so. I mean, this guy looks like bad news. I, I think this is just heartbreak in the making. You try to convince them of that, what's going to happen? <laughs> All right, do they listen and say, wow, mom, I think you're right. I better ditch him tomorrow, okay? <laughs> no, they're like defending. He's great. He makes me feel so good. How can you say that about him, okay? The people, people who are like this at the stage of the Mormon church, that's where they are. If you try to simply attack the church, you're just going to get more defensiveness. They're going to defend their love. So what do you have to do? You have to help them see. You have to help them discover things that they don't know yet about the church. You also have to help them see that they're following an impossible gospel. These are the people that you want to kind of help them come face to face with the Mormonism that they are so in love with. And then you also want to help them see that they don't have a relationship with Jesus. Because probably most of them, that doesn't even cross their minds. Because they're in love with the church. And it's so, I hate to use the word fun, but it's interesting to ask this sort of Mormon, wow, you're like really dedicated. You're this really means a lot to you. Oh, yeah, this is the world to me. It has helped me so much. Well, that's cool. Tell me about your relationship with Jesus. Who's Jesus to you? I mean, how, how close are you to Jesus and all this? What? What do you mean my relationship with Jesus? Well, you know, how often do you talk to him? Talk to him? Yeah, how often do you pray to Jesus? I can't pray to Jesus. Well, why not? Well, because we're supposed to pray to the Father. In the name of Jesus, you pray to the Father. Okay, how do you have a relationship with somebody you never talked to? Usually that's a pretty important part, okay? So you can, but to start taking somebody down that road um, is great because it's an area, and it can be totally non-confrontational in terms of the church. You're not attacking the church at this point. But what you want to do is you want to, you want to burst their bubble a little bit. They need to have the bubble burst. And however you're called to do that, you know, Janelle said this up this morning, we need the sword wielders. And so if some of you are kind of given towards sword wielding, I'm not saying do that with total impunity, no regard for the person, but don't feel like that can't be effective. But if you're not a sword wielder, don't feel like you've got to come on like gangbusters and chop the person to bits. <laughs> That's why being attentive to the spirit and being led by the spirit is so important, which is why this is not... A formula. This is this is broad guidelines. Okay. So what's the focus? The focus is the issues they're not aware of. Have you heard about the fact that Joseph actually had a number of different versions of the first mission that he told? What? I've had more missionaries. They had no clue that there was anything more than what was canonized in their scriptures in terms of what happened with the first mission. And mentioned that there, Joseph actually wrote an account in his own hand that that's quite a bit different. It's like, what you know? Well, yeah. What's interesting now, I just noticed this in the last two months, the Mormon church, on their website, when it talks about the first vision, they are now quoting from, it's only footnoted, but they're quoting from Joseph Smith's account of his first vision where he just encounters Jesus. And it's, it's cited as Joseph Smith's you know, manuscript account in his own hand. So they have acknowledged that and actually quote some of that because it's less offensive. It isn't that all the churches are an abomination. So the stuff that's out there. So the Mormon church has now acknowledged that, which I think is great because now I don't have to prove that point. I go, well, your, Mormon, your own church quotes it right here. They obviously don't give you what's there, but they do acknowledge that it exists. And they're willing to quote that account. So there are a whole host of things. Um, what's the goal? The goal for these people are an openness to grace and further investigation. We want to kind of light a fire under them to start digging deeper. Because they have been so content, they have no interest in doing research. And what you want is to, to, to plant a bit of a seed of doubt or some curiosity or something, even if it's to prove you wrong. 
I invite Mormons to prove me wrong. Say, well, as far as I know, this is true, but you're welcome to prove me wrong. So, you know, go ahead and write me and tell, see if you can find something that disproves this. Because I'd be very open, because if I'm wrong, I want to know it. Because the last thing I want to do is spread bad information about your church. That's not fair. That's not right. So I'm very open to being, to being corrected. So, you know, go ahead. And it's amazing how many of those people you never hear back from. Because, there's, there's, you know, they start digging. But that's what we want. We want them to move toward further investigation. And if you have an encounter with a Mormon, and that's all the farther they get, where they say, you know, I'm going to look into that. That's wonderful. That's a step in the right direction. Let's go to the next one. Apathetic church attender. Okay? This is a person who's stuck in the system. Okay, they're no longer infatuated. They've seen some stuff that they, they wonder about, but they still aren't really ready to leave because their whole world is caught up in doing it. Um, let's go to the next thing. What's their attitude? Their attitude is the terrestrial is good enough for me. Okay, I, I mean, I've had people say that. I've had people say, you know, I'm probably not going to make it to the celestial kingdom, but you know, the terrestrial is going to be fine. Wow. If that's the case, where do we go? What are the relevant truths these people need? Well, what they need to know is the terrestrial is not an option. Okay? The options are you either have eternal life and presence of Heavenly Father or you have outer darkness. Now, the first time you say that to a Mormon, prepare for some wide eyes. Because outer darkness is only for the worst of the apostates. In fact, um, I had Eli even tell me last night that not even all apostates go to outer darkness. You have to be someone that you've had like a personal encounter with, with God where he showed you truth. That I mean, so they continue to soften um, doctrine that is, un, that is uncomfortable. So, but they need to realize it's either eternal life in the presence of God or it's, it's outer darkness. It's total separation from God completely. Um, the other thing they need to know is that perfection is attainable and it's essential. And again, this is where the impossible gospel is great with, with these sort of people who are kind of apathetic and, well, I've been a Mormon all my life. I'm raising my family. It's the best place to have a family. I really don't know any better option, so I'm just kind of here. Okay, this is where they need to hear that they need perfection because they have settled with kind of dueling all I can do, and God's going to do something to make it up. And as long as I'm not as bad as so-and-so, or as long as I don't become an apostate, then I'm going to have an actually okay ending in the end. And they need to know that's not true. So, perfection is not only attainable, perfection is essential. The only way they have God's approval, the only way they have a shot at God seeing them as worthy, is if they are perfect. And it can take a while to get that home. When I talked to Don... That was the hardest thing for him. But he finally, through quoting scriptures and their own teachings, he finally went, yeah, you, you, to be in God's presence, you've got to be perfect. So how do you get there? Um, so the focus is the depth of our personal sin. Mormons pay so little attention to their personal sin. It, it's the big stuff. This Hispanic couple I was talking to last night, I start talking about you know, personal sin, and went to um, the First Nephi passage where it says, you know, you can't be saved in your sins, and, and they've got to be gone. And it was very interesting to hear her redefine sin. Sin is only the big stuff. The only stuff that really matters to God sin-wise is the murder and the adultery and the thievery. But the fact that I had an argument with my husband or that I yelled at my kids, God, God he's not really worried about that stuff. I'm trusting in the mercy of God. She had to say that six times while we were talking. I'm just trusting in the mercy of God, that God's good and he loves me. And as long as I'm kind of working at this thing, I'll be fine. Um, there's a lot of resistance. But that's why you just keep asking questions. And so the depth of our personal sin. Um, I've, had, I've had people um, tell how they sat down with an LBS person with the Ten Commandments. And they just start going through them one by one. Have you ever not put God first in something you were considered doing or something you did? And just run through. And most people, if they're honest, will recognize that they have broken every single one of the commandments. Even the adultery and murder one, because of how Jesus covered this in Matthew, where he says, you know, if you look with lust at a woman in your heart, you've committed adultery. And, you know, any honest man is going to go, oops, got me there, okay. Um, 
and the murder. You ever been mad enough at someone unjustly that maybe you wouldn't necessarily kill them, but you know you wish they were dead, or you were just okay? That's murder in your heart. If you then you're guilty of murder. And they've actually walked through all the commandments to where the person has had to say, "Yeah, this makes me a murderer. This makes me an adulterer. This makes me a thief. This makes me a liar." This makes me a dishonor of my parents. And all of a sudden they realize, whoa, I'm not quite as good a person as I thought. Um, and so that's just another way to try to get. But to get at the depth of personal sin that we all have. And what's the goal? Recognition and conviction of sin. We want them to feel convicted of their sin. Because at this point, sin is not an issue in their life. We want sin to be an issue. Uh, and again, this was kind of the, what happened with Don in Salt Lake City. He finally realized, wow, um, I'm kind of not good off in the eyes of God. And when he realized he had a problem, he was open to a solution. All right, let's go to the next one. The anxious church investigator. Okay, this is a person who's started, they're questioning the system. They're going, okay, is this all it's cracked up to be? These people will not walk up to you on the street and say, Hi, I'm Sally, and I really have some serious questions about the church. Can we talk? Okay, that's not going to happen. These are people that you find out only through talking to them, only through being open. So don't expect these people to wear a sign. But where they're at is they're questioning the system. Uh, one of the other Hispanic men that was in this group where I was talking was there. He admitted <coughs> that he had some issues with how the church handled things and their approaches. Um, the attitude is, the truth might lead me to apostasy or worse. So they're skeptical, but they really don't have a strong desire to investigate because they know where it goes. They know that if this goes toward apostasy, they're sunk. And they, that, that is so scary. Outer darkness is so scary. I love using the term outer darkness. I will not use the term hell with a Mormon because hell's a holding tank. Hell's where you go in between times. Hell's where you can preach the gospel to somebody or hear the gospel in the afterlife. Hell is not a scary place to Mormons. Outer darkness is a scary place. Okay? So I use outer darkness. I, I want them to think outer darkness. I want them to dream about outer darkness. Okay? <laughs> and you think, you know, is that kind of cruel? Not if you're looking to the end. Not if you want the Mormon to come to conviction of sin and you want him to move. So, what are the relevant truths? Jesus said the truth will set you free. These people feel trapped. They don't see a way out. They think they are stuck. Just living their life, hoping nobody notices or asks a lot of questions, and they just kind of get through. Um, the next relevant truth is, Jesus and the Bible predate Joseph. For many of these people, they've not even considered Christianity as an alternative. They don't know how much there is. They don't know that they can take the Bible and Jesus and a correct concept of God and that can, they can take that out of Mormonism with them. Because for them, the question is, where would I go if I leave Mormonism? They don't even know an option. They need to know that there's another option. And you can do that just by sharing your personal testimony. Of your faith in Christ, your walk with Christ, your dedication toward the truth, your love for God, how he's part of your life, how you feel the Spirit, how he leads you, how he's blessed you. Um, for this sort of person, the focus is the importance of knowing and living the truth. They need to realize that this apathy is not good for them. And we need to encourage them to step back into being serious about spiritual things again. Because they've just kind of become spiritually flatlined. What's the goal? <clears throat> they need relationship, not religion. Because Mormon religion has done nothing for them. They need to know, again, there's another option. That it's relationship with God. It's one-on-one. -on -one. It's communication. It's intimacy. It's being known and knowing. That, and that, again, is something you don't have to know a lot about Mormonism to share that. You can share that, and you can create a thirst for people for something different that they don't have. Okay, next one. The skeptical church member. This is a person who is tolerating or cynical about the system. The attitude can be often, it's a fine place to raise a family. And that's what they think. Um, to them, it's just a place to get by. And I think there's probably a lot more of these sort of people in Utah than they're outside of Utah. 
because you can coast um, for so long here and never have anybody call you on it, never have anybody question you. Um, the relevant truths are that all sin and fall short. Last night, as we talked to Eli, while I don't put him as a skeptical church member, he was still um, someone who was open to wanting to know a different perspective. But he was very content with his dedication, with his sincerity. When we talked to him, one of the things he kept expressing over and over is, but I know I can do it. I know I can do it. I know if I just stop trying and just do it, because to try is weak, he grasped that much. He still thought that if he put forth enough effort, if he was sincere and dedicated and really put his mind to it, he could pull this off. And he really had a hard time with Romans 3.23, which says, all have sinned, past tense, that covers everything, and all fall short. All fall short is present tense. Every single one of us, every single day, falls short of the glory of God. That in and of itself is enough to make us deserve hell, or for the Mormon outer darkness. And so the relevant truth we want them to be able to grasp at this point is, every single day of your life, you fall short of God's glory and his perfection. And the cumulative weight of that should be crushing. It should help you realize that simply being tolerant and cynical is not a good way to go. Um, the next, the focus, we're spiritual beings created to be in right relationship with God. These, piece, these people have often jettisoned any hope of any sort of spiritual anything. Uh, if you start talking to them, they think that a good Buddhist and a good Mormon like themselves that isn't really trying hard, everybody's going to end up in the same place because of their sincerity and their dedication. So they need to know that God doesn't grade on a curve. He has an absolute standard. Um, and so the goal is an awareness of the per peril of spiritual bankruptcy. You can't deny that part of your life and, um, and keep moving. All right, the next one. Secret closet doubter or the despairing church defector. These are people who have serious doubts about the system or a strong desire to leave. The attitude is, I'm trapped and I'd get out if I could. Um, this is kind of where Graciela was, the Hispanic woman who called me. Because she was starting to see things that were really bothering her. And she wasn't sure exactly where she should go. And so... The relevant truth is that freedom comes more from finding Jesus than leaving the LDS church. They need to know that it's a religious system and an institution, but freedom isn't ultimately found in leaving one institution and going to another. These are the people who will ask you, well, if the Mormon church isn't right, which one is? Totally misses the point of the question. The question is not which church is right. The question is, what is church? The church is the body of Christ. The church is believers. It's not an institution. But that is a concept that is so foreign that it takes a while to even get your mind around the idea that, that the body of Christ is an organism. It's not an organization. So the relevant truth is that the focus is Jesus Christ wants to enter into a relationship with you. He cares about who you are as an individual. And, and he wants that. And again... As you start talking to this sort of person who um, really doesn't know where to go. I had a Mormon missionary who emailed me from his mission. He was um, originally from Spain. He'd been sent to France. And he'd been there for several months. And he got to this secret closet down or despairing church defector on his mission reading some of the stuff on our website, encountering some stuff on his mission that just wasn't adding up. And so when he emailed me, he was like, what do I do? 
I mean, I, I, I tried to talk to my bishop initially, and I know if I go back to him, I'm in, I'm in bad trouble. They, they want me to continue. And we emailed back and forth a couple of times, and, you know, what I told him was, is, one, I'll be praying for you. Two, you've got to seek God on this. And you've got to realize that the Mormon church as an institution doesn't have any power on you or your spiritual life. Um, he wrote me back about two weeks later and said, um, Joel, I just want you to know, um, I finally realized I couldn't keep doing this. He said, so I packed my bags one night. Um, I bought a ticket, and I left at like 5.30 in the morning before my companion woke up, and I just, I just walked out, and I'm back home. The good news was his parents were LDS, so he didn't come back to um, that ostracization. But he hit a place where what he needed to know was Jesus was for him. And the cool thing was it was probably... I'm going to say a year or so later, he emailed me again to say, I found Jesus. Amen. Um, to say, I get it. I understand. It is so cool. And, and that's where he needed to go. And it, it took a while. Um, patience is so important because nobody moves fast. So the goal is we want them to understand the differences in the LDS and Biblical Gospel. They need to realize what's at stake. And it's so, it's so great when that happens, even if they don't. Because Eli last night, we could tell when he got it. Becky and I are looking at him. And something in his eyes changed. And the big tip-off was, after looking at the pen that we had on the table that was representing the gift, that you just had to pick up and take, that you weren't allowed to put two bucks on the table to cover it, because you do that, it's not a gift anymore. He said, I understand. And then what he said is, but you need to know that I believe that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God, and the Book of Mormon is true, and he in effect bore his testimony, which Becky and I both took as a very good sign, because when a Mormon has no other answer but to bear their testimony, you realize they hit a brick wall. They don't, they don't have anywhere else. That's the fallback. That's the ultimate escape hatch. And since he didn't do it in the glazed eyes over total disconnect, I didn't like stamp my fingers or clap my hands in his face or anything. We just you know, let him say it. Because it was more with, I have never seen a Mormon bear his testimony with so much almost anguish. It was like, this is all I've got. And at that point, it wasn't the time to snatch that away and pound him into bits. With the Bible, okay? That, that wouldn't have been charitable or loving or kind. And instead we just said, okay, we understand. We're glad you're wrestling with this. Because if you just jump into this without any second thought, we realize that what we have put before you on the table is a total paradigm shift. You have understood the difference between the two systems and what it means and how you get right with God. And that's good. And, you know, we just want you to know, we understand you'll probably have to wrestle with this for a while. But we have every confidence that because of your heart being open toward God, and God's spirit at work in you, he will draw you. Jesus said no one can come to the Father unless the Father draws him. And our hope is that God reaches out and grabs you by the shirt and draws you in. <laughs> to which he just laughed and said, okay. Um, but that's where, that's, that's what the goal is. Okay, let's finish up because I want to have at least a little bit of time for questions. Angry, informed, disillusioned. Very important category. Thank you to, I believe it was uh, Jimmy and somebody else who last year said, hey, you've got to be careful um, because you may run into angry Mormons and you may think initially that they are the angry church defender, the absolute church loyalist, when really what they may be is an angry, informed, disillusioned one. They have seen it. They have seen the Mormon church from another perspective, and, and right now their attitude is, I'm ticked off at how much time, effort, and money I've wasted. Because I just poured 5, 10, 30, 50 years of my life into this. I can't get it back. And, and I'm ticked. I am, I am angry enough to spit nails. And that's okay. But I say this because you may run into a Mormon as you start talking about Mormonism who is angry. 
listen and ask questions because if they're here, they are so close to the gospel. They are so much further along the path than just the angry church defender. And what you don't want to do is say, oh, I've got another angry Mormon. Okay. No. Listen. And um, so the relevant truth is the one true God is good all the time and makes no mistakes. They need to hear that the God of the Bible is way bigger than their life and their problems and what they're going through, that God has a purpose, and are they willing to grab a hold of a God who's bigger than them that's not the God of the LDS church? And so the focus is our life has a purpose, and God cares more about our character than our comfort. This can be kind of hard to say to somebody who's at this point, but they need to hear it. They need to hear it's not about you and your comfort level. God cares about you and your relationship with him. And if he has to bring you through some disillusionment and even some anger, guess what? God can handle it. God can handle you being ticked off. It's okay to be ticked off. Where are you going to go with it? Are you going to go bitter, cynical? Are you going to turn your back on everything? Or are you going to go to a God who is far bigger than that and who is actually allowing this for your benefit because he has something so much better for you? And let me tell you this. If you don't believe that yourself, please don't try to tell a Mormon that. Because if you're not convinced yourself that God is far more interested in your character and your relationship with him than he is your personal comfort, then you, there's no way you can communicate that to a Mormon with any truth or sincerity. So I would challenge each of you that are here this morning to come to grips with that yourself. Because I can guarantee you, if you stay committed to Jesus, you will be uncomfortable at some point in your life. You will be ticked. You will be disillusioned. You will say, this is not what I signed up for in the Christian life. But that's all part of maturity. And that's when you get a chance to really go and find out who your God is. And find out what he wants for you. Which is an incredible depth and intimacy. And when you can talk to a Mormon out of that depth of relationship, it is, it is undeniable. Um, so the goal is to help them refocus the energy fueling the anger rather than stuff it and turn to God in brokenness. Because that's where they need to go. They need to go to God with all that. Okay. Some final thoughts. As you're talking to more people, and go ahead and put all these up because I'm just going to run through them quick. Um, these are just some things to keep in mind as you're talking in, in general. First of all, think what would reach you. <coughs> Excuse me. Put yourself in the Mormon shoes and say, okay, if I was like this person, what sort of approach would reach me? What would impact me? What would draw me out? What sort of questions would I be interested in answering? Second, realize that the issue may not be the issue. In other words, you may have a person, if you mention something about Mormonism, they all of a sudden become really hot and bothered. You've touched some kind of a nerve. What you need to know is that particular issue may not be the issue. I had one woman who, when we were talking about polygamy, she just like, was super, was super angry. Well, what finally came out through the course of the conversation was, it wasn't so much that polygamy was her hot button issue, it was the fact that by challenging Mormonism, I was challenging the faith of the family that had taken her in out of a broken home and she had been raised by Mormons. And so the issue for her was, by challenging Mormonism, and the topic happened to be polygamy, I was challenging her whole family background and the people that were the only ones in her life as a kid that meant anything to her. That was the issue. So polygamy wasn't the issue. And so be aware that there may be more issues under the surface. Feel free to probe. If you get a really strong reaction, feel free to say, wow, that seems to touch a nerve. What? You want, you want to tell me about that? Mm -hmm. um, you might be surprised at some of what you get from people. Okay? Win the heart, open the mind. Don't be afraid to engage people at a, at a personal level. Because if you've got their heart, they're going to be a whole lot more willing in to listen to what you have to say. It's hard to shoot a beautiful messenger. You guys have heard the expression, right? Hey, don't shoot the messenger. Okay, we're messengers of the gospel. The gospel message is offensive. It's a scandal. It is a total paradigm shift to what the Mormon has been taught. However, even though our message is offensive, we don't need to be personally. We need to be the most winsome, caring, beautiful messengers that we can 
Okay, you, let me ask you this question. How many of you have had to go to like customer service at some place and the person behind the counter was like this gorgeous woman? It was like this really handsome guy. Why are they there? Yeah, so you can't get angry. Because why? Because it's really hard to get angry at someone who is attractive. I mean, it doesn't mean you can't, but they know. You come up and say, this, this thing, this is like the third one of these. It doesn't work. I want my money back. It's like, I don't care if my time has expired on this. This is a piece of junk. And wow, I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's got to really be bad. Man, I, you know, I hope I can help you. I said, well, you know, I, well, tell you what, let, let me check into that. Why, wow, that's your third one, huh? Man, you gotta be really frustrated having to come back here again for the third time. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll see what I can do. Call on the phone, go talk to somebody. Wow, I'm really sorry. What's, what's happened there? The company knows. It's gonna be hard for you to take it out on somebody who is attractive. There is nothing wrong with us being winsome people. So that people, because people are going to reject the message, but we should not be offensive for the sake of being offensive. There's nowhere in the gospel that says that we are supposed to be offensive in terms of how we relate to people. Now, that doesn't mean you can't be confrontational. I love Rob. Rob is a very beautiful messenger in spite of the fact that he holds nothing back. Why is that? Because... He cares about people, and people know that. You can see it in his eyes. That's who, and that's why I'm saying, I'm not advocating here a methodology of non-confrontation. We must confront Mormons and other people with the truth. If we care at all, we must confront them with the truth. 